many of us ever know what it is to become the perfect version of ourselves? This is Decoding Superhuman with your host, Boomer Anderson. Superhumans, do you mind if I begin with a little confession? I confess that I go down the wormhole on ideas or subjects quite often. It allows me to do deep research into a different field. And usually when I go down the wormhole in something, I start with my favorite area to get really scientific information, and that's PubMed. You could also use Google Scholar, I guess. But my guest today is an expert in a problem I was trying to solve about a year ago. And I was looking at music and saying, well, is there a scientific way where I can use music to improve my performance, whether that be physical or focus? And so I went into PubMed and I came across uh, this gentleman who's a professor at Brunel University in London. Dr. Costas Karagiorgis is a leader in sports psychology and a divisional lead for sport, health, and exercise sciences. And I must confess, it's going to take me a little while to read his bio because he's done so much. Costas has established an international reputation for his research into the psychological, psychophysiological, and neurophysiological effects of music. He has captured over 25 academic grants during his career. He's the author of two textbooks, 12 book chapters, 80 peer-reviewed journal articles, and over 100 professional papers in sport and exercise psychology. Costas's music research has been featured in newspapers all around the world, most recently in The Times, Independent, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and the Sydney Morning Herald. He is currently working on a multimodal simulation during physical activity that entails the use of music, video images, virtual reality, and visual primes. Sounds really interesting, right? Costas acts as a consultant psychologist to a number of international and professional athletes, I get to pick his brain on this one by the way, and has worked with a wide variety of UK governing bodies in sport. This includes British Athletics, British Canoe Union, British Water Ski Federation, and England Hockey. He has also worked with many multinational companies in the sports world and music industry. During his spare time, and it sounds like he doesn't have too much of that, Costas plays the piano often performing in a jazz and Latin duo with drummer Joel Shopland. And so how did I actually come across Costas? Well, I said earlier that I found his research on PubMed. I found it fascinating. And so I dropped him an email. He was kind enough to respond, and it actually led to a multi-month email exchange about optimizing performance through music. So Dr. Kara Georges, thank you for entertaining my emails first. But what did we talk about? Well, we started with a basic question, which is what is music? We talked about how to reduce rate of perceived exertion through music. What do Britain's top athletes have in common in terms of musical interests? One of Dr. Kara Georges' students was actually an Olympic boxer. And we talk about the music that that particular individual used to listen to before going into the ring, and also what Mr. Olympia, or former Mr. Olympia, Dorian Yates, listens to before a big workout. And I must say, on Dorian's part, that I do love the music that he listens to when he goes to the squat rack. The show notes for this one, and you're going to want to check them out, including all of Dr. Kara Georges' books, can be found at decodingsuperhuman.com slash Costas. That's C-O-S-T-A-S. Along the lines of enhancing performance, particularly cognitive performance, there is one name that usually comes to mind, for me at least, in the supplement industry, and that is Neurohacker Collective. I've had Jordan Greenhall, the CEO, on the show before, and you know I I love what they're doing. And so Neurohacker Collective has a couple of products now and more coming out in the future, but one of which is Qualia, which I use five of seven days every week. And then the second one is Qualia Mind, which I use on occasion just when I want to mix it up a little bit. But uh, Qualia has over 40 ingredients and has significantly upgraded both my own well-being, but also this concept of sovereignty, which you can go look at the Jordan podcast later if you want. But if you want to enhance your cognition, I personally believe there's nothing better out there on the market. So how do you get started? Well, you can go over to neurohacker.com, and as you're checking out, plug in the code BOOMER, as in my name, B-O-O-M-E-R, and you'll get 10% off your purchase. 
If you want to subscribe, you get 15% off. I hope you enjoy the products and do, do yourself a favor. Just check it out. One month, all you need to do. Anyways, on with the show. Dr. Kara Georges, welcome to the show. Thank you very much indeed, Boomer. It's good to be with you. Before we get started with all my loads of questions today for you, I, I just wanted to briefly introduce the audience with how I came across your work. Because about a year, a year and a half ago, I was doing quite a bit of research on my own as to how to optimize the music I was listening to for workouts to achieve better levels of performance. And sure enough, when I go to my favorite resource, which is PubMed, uh, your name came up and you were gracious enough to respond to my emails. So I I really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, Well, actually, I was expecting a Dutch accent today. (laughs) I'm surprised to get a North American one. But uh, as I say, it's an absolute pleasure to be with you today. And uh, I look forward to chatting about my favorite topic. Well, I hope I don't disappoint with the American accent, but I I guess let's kick things off with a basic question. Well, it may not be so basic after all. How do you define music? That absolutely isn't a basic question. Generally in the sphere that I work, music has to do with the organization of melody, harmony, and rhythm. Those three basic ingredients. So the melody is the highest part of the music, the part that you might choose to hum along to or whistle, what we call the tune. The harmony has to do with the combination of notes. And this can often give music a particular mood to make it feel sad or happy or all of the emotions in between. The rhythm has to do with the accentuation of the music. So, for example, much music is played with a, a common beat, which is... Some is played in a sort of a three time, like a waltz. But there are many other permutations. So, for example, there's a famous album by the celebrated jazz musician Dave Brubeck, and he plays with time and uses all sorts of weird and wonderful rhythms such as uh, 9-8. So that's rhythm. Rhythm combined with harmony and melody make music. And music is something that has been with the human species since the dawn of time. It's something that has evolved with the human species and it characterizes many of the formal and informal events in human life. The question that immediately comes to mind for me is how did you start studying music? Because I've seen references to your work going back to 1997, but your background is in psychology. Is that right? Well, uh, I actually started research five years prior to that. And my first publications were in 1995. But I guess it depends which which database you look at. (laughs) Absolutely right. So what's my background? I think to really understand how I got into this field of scientific research, you have to look right back at my childhood. And I grew up in a poor but rather colorful enclave of South London. The flat in which I resided with my extended family was located immediately above a secondhand record store. So as you might imagine, every morning, rather than being awoken by the sweet sound of birdsong or the sun breaking gently through the neck curtains, there would be this thuddering bass coming through the floorboards from the uh, store beneath that would jolt me out of bed. And I'd wipe my sleepy eyes, look out of the window, and notice that when passers-by came within earshot of the music, it would change their physiognomy the way they looked. It would put a lilt into their stride. And the music served as the auditory backdrop for everything that took place in my neighborhood. So from a very early age, I became interested in how music affected the human psyche. Also, when I was growing up, uh, I happened to be a very good runner. You had to be a good runner where I was growing up, otherwise otherwise you got shot. But the music and and sports in my life tended to take place very separately in my early years. My sporting ability was picked up by my physical education teachers, and I was directed to the Crystal Palace National Sports Centre, which was close to where I lived. Uh, And there I began my athletics career, but concurrently I had a music career. I played a number of instruments uh, initially, but settled with the piano 
and played in various establishments uh, as, uh, as I was a student and growing into adulthood. But at university, I was able to study for an undergraduate program, believe it or not, in music and sports sciences. It was a joint honors program. Wow. And of course, in terms of these two areas, never the twain shall meet. They happened very separately. In fact, they were even on separate campuses. But when I got into my final year, I begged my tutors to allow me to combine the two so that I could explore the impact, the influence of music on athletic performance. And a few years prior to that, I'd noticed how the great American athletes such as Ed Moses and Willie Banks would use music as part and parcel of their pre-event routine. They would come to the Crystal Palace National Sports Center every year to compete in an athletics Grand Prix. And I became interested in the athletic application of music. And so eventually my lecturers allowed me to study this for my third year dissertation. And that was the first sort of formal research that I conducted. From there, I went to study in the States. I did a master's degree. um, And there I did a a large review of literature that I turned into a meta-analysis eventually for my master's thesis. A few years down the line, I went on to publish a review paper out of that. And that's been one of the most cited papers in my field. I came back to England. I initiated a doctoral program. And when that finished, My work was picked up by Nike. I started doing some work with them on the portable sport audio. Other engagements followed, research grants, publications. I built my own team. Things really took off in this field, I would say, with the advent of ergonomically designed MP3 players, such as the Nike Sport Portable Audio back in the early noughties, that allowed people to Uh, engage in physical activity without having cumbersome equipment get in their way. And when I was young, uh, a portable stereo was uh, a stacked hi-fi, a car battery, two skateboards, and a dog lead. That that was your portable stereo. So things have changed very much since that time. And from needing an attic to store your music collection, you can now store it on a USB just weighing a few grams. Can we go into a bit of your research? Because you've spent a lot of time researching the effects of music on athletic performance predominantly, but other areas as well. To put it broadly, what kind of conclusions have you been able to draw? There's a couple of papers that I would love to reference, but we can go through those as you mentioned some of the things that you have been able to conclude. So my program of research over the last quarter of a century or so has had various strands One of those strands has used music to very simply make the exercise environment more pleasurable. Invariably, when people are working out, particularly at a moderate to high intensity, it can be quite onerous. They can experience quite negative feelings. And due to this, it can prevent them from adhering or sticking to a physical activity program. And so I've experimented with music to reduce perceived exertion to enhance the mood state of exercisers and athletes, and also to rearrange electrical activity in the brain. What this research shows in sum is that at low to moderate intensities of exercise, music reduces perceived exertion on average by around 10%. If the music is well selected with an individual's preferences in mind, the type of activity that they're doing and the intensity of that activity, then the reduction in perceived exertion can be as great as 12%. But interestingly, even if the music is fairly arbitrarily selected, the benefit can be as great as 8%. But the average is 10, as I say. This effect, it doesn't hold when people are working out at a high intensity. So beyond about 75% of their max. And this is a very consistent finding in our body of work here at Brunel University London, but also in the work that's been been conducted by many other research groups around the world. This um, phenomenon that music is ineffectual in reducing perceived exertion at high intensities is something that we've been researching in some detail uh, recently. And It would appear that when you get beyond about 75% of your max, the messages that come from the musculature and the vital organs become overwhelming. And so it's hard for the central processing system to tune into the music and to 
benefit from it in terms of a dissociative tool. In very simple terms, if we think of the human nervous system as being analogous to internet bandwidth, the afferent nervous system that takes messages from the musculature to the central processing system, it has a limited capacity. And so at low to moderate intensities of exercise, the music takes up some of that capacity and it prevents negative feelings or fatigue-related sensations from entering focal awareness. And this is why for many people, music makes exercise seem less hard. But at high exercise intensities, these messages become overwhelming and it's hard to focus on the music and so it doesn't reduce perceived exertion. But interestingly, despite the fact that music does not reduce perceived exertion at high exercise intensities, our research shows that it does still elevate your emotional states. It makes you feel better. It gives you a better affective state. And that could be because music has a direct influence on the pleasure centers of the brain, such as the cerebellum, the reptilian brain, and the amygdala, and doesn't require a great deal of processing higher up in the cortex in order to influence how people feel. I often use the sentence that at high intensities of exercise, although music doesn't influence what you feel, it influences how you feel it. It has a bearing on your interpretation of fatigue. It, it colors those fatigue-related signals and makes exercise more pleasurable. Another big area that we've been working on over the course predominantly of the last 15 years or so is known as auditory motor synchronization. And this is where we try to synchronize the movement rate of athletes or exercisers with a musical beat. One of the main purposes of doing this is that with this mode of application, the music can have an ergogenic or a work enhancing effect. And just to illustrate the principle, 20 years ago, I was at the National Indoor Arena in Birmingham in the Midlands here in the UK for an athletics indoor Grand Prix meeting. Uh, athletics is my big passion mm -hmm. other than music. And on the bill for that day was the much lauded Ethiopian distance runner, Haile Gabra Selassie. He was competing in the 2000 meters and he'd announced in advance that he was going to attempt a world best time for the 2000 meters. Now, interestingly, he asked the race organizers to play his favorite pop song, Scatman by Scatman John. Do, 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 to play that during the race. Mm -hmm. And I recall that as the gun went off, the music was blaring over the PA and Gabra Selassie stormed off, leaving his competitors trailing in his wake. Concurrently, the Ethiopian contingent in the crowd was sent into a frenzy and the great man went on to break Eamon Coughlin's world best by some one and a half seconds, which is a huge margin in track and field terms. Now, he was interviewed by Athletics Weekly, a very famous publication here in the UK, after the race and asked about his choice of music. And he said that it fitted in with his world record pace. Now, of course, we have analyzed how synchronous music works. And it would appear, when we look at it experimentally, that it makes movement more energy efficient. You require 6 to 7% less oxygen to be processed by the body when working out in the synchronous mode. Why is this? Well, it appears that the music serves a type of metronomic function in eliminating some of the periodicities or inconsistencies in human locomotion to render people's movement more efficient. And with those increased efficiencies in biomechanical terms come greater physiological efficiencies, which is often why when you're exercising in time with music, the exercise feels easier. Another strand is that we have assessed how music can be used before you work out, before you engage in a big athletic event, or even before you engage in a work-related task that might be important to you like an interview or a presentation or such like, you know, a, a kind of situation that is often threatening and can make people feel anxious. Music is very effective at regulating mindset. Even if you look 
at a, a mother with a, a young child. Music is a very powerful tool in sedating the child through the use of lullaby, perhaps, to allow that child to enter a deep sleep. It has a soporific, soporific effect. Similarly, if the music is loud and upbeat and aggressive, it can have the converse effect. It can have a stimulating effect. And so music can be used to regulate mindset pre-competition and pre-exercise. In an exercise context, it's generally stimulation that is required. People struggle to get up for exercise, to get stimulated, to get motivated. And so in particular, when you select music that has a strong extra musical association, now let's take tracks from the Rocky film series, for example. One of my favorites. Gonna Fly Now, Eye of the Tiger. When you hear those tracks, perhaps it's not just that they're intrinsically stimulating, but we hold a number of extra musical associations. We think of boxers working out. We think of the underdog prevailing. We think of the protagonist, Rocky Balboa, sprinting up the steps of the museum in Philadelphia and raising his, his arms aloft. There are all sorts of images. Uh, and in fact, film is a great medium for the meshing of music and imagery. Think, for example, of a, a film like Chariots of Fire. The uh, eponymous theme music is not necessarily stimulating per se. It has a very slow tempo. But when you hear that music, you imagine those great Olympians of old striding along the sands of St. Andrews in their long white shorts. And it conjures heroic images in us. It implores us to go to a different plane. So pre-event, pre-task, music can be a powerful stimulus in changing our mindset or gravitating our mood to a place that is congruent with the mood that's required to perform optimally in a given activity. Now, there's one other area that we've worked on in detail, and this is just over the four, last four or five years, um, during which we've engaged in a new area of research that concerns recuperative music. Now, this is the use of music as a recuperative tool. It can be used in between high-intensity exercise bouts. We call that respite music. Or it can be used at the end of a workout during static recovery. We call that uh, recuperative music. And essentially, we've used a number of indices, such as hemodynamic measures, blood pressure, heart rate, cortisol, which is a stress hormone, various psychological measures. And collectively, the types of measures that we use show that if you use this um, type of recovery music, let's call it, in between high intensity bouts, it should be of a moderate tempo, ideally around 120, 125 BPM. And if you use it after a workout to recuperate and revitalize, ideally it should start at around 90 beats per minute and gradually bring you down towards a state of homeostasis, a resting state with a tempo of 60 to 70 BPM. Um, so you can see just with those examples that when you're using music in a functional way, you have to think very carefully about the exact function that music is serving and select it accordingly so that it serves you well in terms of the type of mindset that you wish to engender. You know, whether you want to go into another high-intensity exercise bout, whether you want to completely relax and recuperate, or even uh, if you want to get yourself hyper-psyched up because you're going into a, a wrestling ring, a boxing ring, or about to lift heavy weights. That was great, and thank you for walking through that. Now, there are a couple examples in your book that I just wanted to go through that I think will really kind of nail it home for the audience, uh, one of which was actually a student of yours. Uh, I believe his name is Audley Harrison. Is that right? Yeah, um, Audley Harrison was a student of mine in the mid to late 1990s. He was actually one of my favorite students, and uh, we even stay in touch today. 20 years later. Audley Harrison was uh, a boxer of some talent, but not prolific talent when I first met him. And I recall sort of uh, late in 1997, he pronounced to fellow students in class that he was going to become a Commonwealth super heavyweight boxing champion in Kuala Lumpur. And everybody just laughed at him. Uh, they didn't take him quite seriously. He went to those games in uh, Malaysia 
and he duly won the gold medal. And he came back to class with it and was swinging it in front of people very proudly and went on to proclaim that in Sydney at the Olympic Games in two years' time, he was going to become Olympic champion. And people were falling over themselves wow. laughing again. But, you know, true to his word, he went to those Sydney Olympics on the other side of the world. He prepared thoroughly, but nothing could really prepare him for the anxiety and the uncertainty that he faced going through the rounds en route to the final. And what Audley did was that he took advantage of Japanese classical music in order to soothe his pre-fight nerves in advance of each fight. And this is music that is predicated on what we call in psychomusicology, the pentatonic scale. Now, if you imagine, Boomer, the sound that you get when you only play around with the black keys on a piano, that oriental type sound, that typifies the pentatonic scale. Now, slow music played with this pentatonic scale increases alpha brainwave activity associated with a sense of calm and focus. And this is exactly the sort of mindset that Audley wanted to induce to counter the anxiety that he was feeling at those Olympic Games. And of course, Audley prevailed. He won the gold medal. And, and he'd graduated, of course, by that point. But I brought him back and I introduced him to the new cohort of students. And he very proudly told everybody about his achievements and then said, even more boldly still, that he would become undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. And people wow. laughed again. But he did go on to win uh, one version of that crown. He had a successful career that was supported by the BBC in its early stages. And um, as some of your listeners might know, he's gone on to a career in reality TV. And he's quite a, a big personality. Anyone who knows Audley realizes just what a great character he is and what a larger than life character he is. Fantastic story. In your book, there's another character, well, you mentioned quite a few, but there's one who I would guess would qualify on sort of the other end of the spectrum in terms of music, and that was Dorian Yates. Do you mind just touching a little bit on sort of his preparatory work? Because Dorian Yates is, you know, pretty famous in terms of the bodybuilding world. So the uh, Dorian Yates, uh, a character that I've called the heavy metal Hercules, uh, this story that appears in my book, I actually got from my former PhD supervisor, Professor Craig Sharp, who sadly passed away recently. And uh, Dorian is uh, an athlete who resides in Birmingham, which is where my uh, former supervisor came from. And he was a six-time Mr. Olympia winner. He dominated the Iron Game for the best part of the 1990s. And he sculpted his body over a career that saw him lift something in the order of 40,000 tons uh, at the rate of between 11 tons for chest and arms and 41 tons for legs per workout. It's insane. <laughs> so yeah, it's absolutely insane. When he began lifting, he weighed in at a paltry 180 pounds, which is uh, 82 kilograms. So he was a mere mortal. But just a few years later, in an out-of-competition phase and properly hydrated, he was heavier by some 100 pounds or 45 kilograms. How was this superhumanity achieved? Well, to some extent, the heavy metal on Dorian's Walkman was every bit as important as the iron on his barbells. And each day at the gym, he strained to the strains of Aerosmith and pounding tracks such as Pearl Jam's Spin the Black Circle and Go offered the auditory backdrop for the developments of his chest, shoulders, abs, and arms. And, and actually, Guns N' Roses was the catalyst for the real insanity of leg day, for which he warmed up with a casual two sets of 12 reps at over a 1,000 pounds on the leg press, followed by his Bulgarian split squats, which were performed to the rousing lyric of Welcome to the Jungle. So... As I say, Yates now runs a, a thriving gym business in the Midland city of Birmingham, the, uh, the city of his birth, which uh, I guess, like its most massive son, has swelled in proportions in recent decades. So that's, that's Dorian and his heavy metal, one of the most 
famous bodybuilders of all time. When you're doing some of these experiments and focusing on, for instance, 400 meter sprint intervals in correlation with music, how are you measuring the brain waves? Because there's a paper that you recently released called The Way You Make Me Feel. And not only do I love the title, but some of the conclusions of that paper were in regards to music versus podcast versus no music. Do you mind walking through some of the experiments, how these experiments are conducted? Yeah, in recent years, we've conducted a whole series of experiments that take, if you like, an under the bonnet perspective that not only look at how music influences human performance, but also how music influences the brain. And through those experiments, we're learning of music's propensity to almost completely rearrange the electrical activity in the brain and also influence how different regions of the brain communicate with one another. Now, to directly address your question, we're now able to conduct brain research outdoors, even on 400 meter tracks, through mobile EEG technology that we've had access to relatively recently. Prior to that, we were stuck to doing uh, research in laboratories, in cages, cages that we call Faraday cages, that block extraneous electrical signals from interfering with the electrical signals of the brain. What we are seeing is um, pretty much as we would expect that very lively music has the ability to elevate arousal related indicators such as beta brainwave activity. And then more soothing tracks such as those used by Audley Harrison increase the alpha brainwave activity. But interestingly, what we've been seeing when running protocols with exhaustive tasks is that music blocks out lower frequency brain waves, such as theta waves. And that might be part of the mechanism that underlies music ergogenic effect in endurance type activities. Allied to that, we're seeing that um, sensory areas of the brain are communicating less with the region of the brain that essentially serves in an executive control function and tells the body to stop. So the messaging that goes on across brain regions that forces us to stop during exhaustive exercise is reduced when we use music. There's another part of this, slightly more nuanced, Boomer, in looking at the electrical activity of the brain. It's a slightly serendipitous finding, but what we've uncovered is um, when looking at how neuropopulations, so clusters of neurons, synchronize, desynchronize, and resynchronize in response to music and when we use other stimuli such as podcasts or silence, you have a regular frequency of this synchronization, desynchronization, resynchronization of these clusters. When you use music, that frequency is reduced, it's slowed down. And you get larger energy, if you like, coming through neuropopulations at a lower frequency, indicating that there's less mental energy or mental activity needed to engage in certain physical activities, i.e. your movements become more autonomous. You're more likely to enjoy a flow state when you are using music. There's less conscious processing. And what's more interesting still is that when we've looked at this synchronization cycle in tandem with muscular activity, where we put electrodes on prime movers during activities such as cycling, we see that this peak of electrical activity in the brain induced by music is associated with stronger neural signals being received in the muscle. So not only is it resulting in greater immersion in the activity, but it's also having an influence on how we move, and the efficiency of those movements. So as you can see through that explanation, much of the observational research that we've conducted in recent decades is being reinforced or franked by some of the more mechanistic research that we have been able to conduct in very recent years. So blockage of, I guess, the normal bodily responses to fatigue, et cetera, as well as just general immersion and 
exercise efficiency. These are all great, great things. And if I'm the recreational, you know, weekend warrior, so to speak, doing my Spartan race, this is fantastic, right? It gives me the ability to go further. In professional competitions, is this why in, in certain cases you find that, I believe in certain marathons actually, that music is banned? Is it because it does have a statistically significant effect on performance? Well, music certainly does have an ergogenic effect when you're not using it synchronously. The work enhancing effect is relatively small, but nonetheless, it's, it's consistent in the literature. I remember in 2007, when the New York Marathon decided to ban music, the university switchboard was jammed with journalists from the US calling in to seek opinion about how this ban would influence a runner's performance. And indeed, I remember uh, at that marathon, they had to introduce iPod police because that was the urge of runners to use their iPods. They, they were not to be parted from them by any means. So look, it does have an ergogenic effect. It has been banned. Has it been banned because of the ergogenic effect? I think not. I think it's possibly because uh, it's more of a health and safety factor. Music can be so immersing, so intoxicating that it can distract runners from other runners around them. They can bump into each other. Um, they can run into obstacles. They can get knocked over. So I think a uh, part of the move to make these mass participation events safer, and also remember we live in a very risk averse culture now, music has been banned. But having said that, I have worked on mass participation events that have introduced music and had it as part and parcel of the whole experience. Uh, and indeed, from 2007 until 2010, and perhaps in direct response to what happened in New York, I worked with the International Management Group to uh, initiate the Run to the Beat series of half marathons. And this series was deliberately coordinated with live and pre-recorded music on a half marathon course in Greenwich in Southeast London. These events proved to be hugely successful. And, and what I'm really proud of in regard to these events is that most mass participation events of this nature tend to attract a 60% male participation and a 40% female participation. In Run to the Beat, we managed to do the converse. So we had a 60% female participation. And many of those females were first time half marathon participants. And so we used the power of music and exercise to bring a whole new constituency into habitual physical activity. We used the power of the internet to harvest runners' musical predilections. And I would use those then to create playlists. We actually created albums and playlists with recognized labels such as Ministry of Sound. And the whole thing proved uh, very popular. It really was for me a great privilege to work on a project that was on such a large scale that merged everything that I'd been working on in theoretical, empirical and practical terms. It was one of the peaks of my professional life. That's very cool. Question for you, because there's something that I came across in reading your research called the Brunel Music Rating Inventory. Do you mind going into what that is and how it can the average layman use it? When I first started working in this field, Boomer, over a quarter of a century ago, it was characterized by a lack of theory. When you have a lack of theory in a scientific area, it results in a rather scattergun approach to research. So what findings? You haven't got anything to pin the findings against to know if they're valid or not. And so one of the first jobs was to develop theoretical frameworks and emanating from those theoretical frameworks, a series of instruments that could be used to rate the qualities of music. And one of the very first instruments that I worked on, there, there are several now, but one of the first, one of the most famous, I guess, and one of those that's been translated into other languages is the Brunel Music Rating Inventory. The purpose of this instrument is to rate the motivational qualities of music for exercise or sport. And this instrument, is uh, available in chapter three of my book, Applying Music in Exercise and Sport. So it's widely available. If any of your listeners have my other book, Inside Sports Psychology, it's uh, in chapter eight there also. It's also available for free 
online if they want to uh, have a look at the Brunel University Research Archive and then search for the BMRI2 paper. They can download that for free and use the instrument. So the purpose of the instrument is that you can use it to rate the motivational qualities of a large pool of music to then gradually whittle it down to tracks that you will use for your own workout or for your own sporting activity. It's a way of reducing a large pool of tracks to a small, highly motivating pool of tracks that is likely to be potent and useful to your own athletic endeavors. I will link to all of this in the show notes, which are going to be found at decodingsuperhuman.com slash Costas. Uh, that's C-O-S-T-A-S. Dr. Kara Georges, I think the question on everybody's mind is, if you were to construct the ultimate playlist for yourself or for anyone else, how would you go about doing it? In response to that, Boomer, I have to say that uh, one person's music is another person's noise. It's the case that there's no one size fits all with music selection. It's a very personal medium. And so if I am creating a playlist for myself, which I do on a very uh, regular basis, I begin by looking at my own musical predilections. I might look at particular albums or artists that are meaningful for me uh, and my social cultural background. So it might be Wham or Queen or Black Eyed Peas, some of my favorite acts from the, from the past. I would then consider the sort of mental state that I need all the way from uh, psyching up and thinking about initiating in that activity through the warm up, the belly of the activity, the warm down, and then recuperation or revitalization. You can think of a music program almost contouring your expected heart rate, starting at a low point, having a peak, and then gradually coming down. If you're engaged in interval training, such as HIT, high-intensity interval training, it might be that you have peaks and troughs in the energy of the music so as to reflect the physiological peaks and troughs in the workout. So I think the desired mental state and the underlying physiological state are drivers for the type of music that you would select. If I was uh, stretching, for example, I might use a track such as no Diggity. Oh, such a good one. Black Street. It features Dr. Dre and Queen Pan in an R&B style at 89 BPM. It's just right for that type of activity. If I was in the early stages of a workout, maybe engaged in an aerobic warm-up, I might use a track such as The Power by Snap. It has a strong lyrical affirmation. It raises my physiological level slightly at 109 BPM. It's in the style of hip house, which is one of my favorite styles. And if I wanted to increase the level of my physiological arousal a little bit further still, I might go for a track such as Gonna Make You Sweat by C Plus C Music Factory featuring Freedom Williams. It's going back to my formative years a little bit, but clearly that has an excellent lyric that's allied to what you want to be doing during physical activity. Going up a little bit more in terms of intensity, maybe into the uh, belly of a cardio workout, a track such as uh, Rhythm is a Dancer by Snap at 125 beats per minute. That's in the uh, Eurodance idiom. It would be absolutely ideal. Working at a higher intensity still, um, let's say I'm doing interval training, high intensity. Let's say it's plyometric type training, which I sometimes do. I might use a track with a lyrical affirmation for plyometrics or jumping type activity, such as Keep On Jumping by the Lisa Marie Experience at a rip-roaring tempo of 132 BPM. Has a very strong and steady house beat. And then, Boomer, I might want to engage in a cool down. Then I turn on my lighthouse family, lifted, to leave me feeling mentally lifted and revitalized during my cool down. And then perhaps during my final stretch out, I might use the dulcet tones of Mariah Carey and the track Hero leaving me with heroic feelings as I prepare for the rest of the day. If I were to create my optimal playlist, they're the considerations and even a few illustrations of the 
sorts of tracks that I would pick for myself. This is great. Great blend of imagery. And I appreciate you walking through the beats per minute science behind it. That was yeah. So, helpful. I mean, I was trying to illustrate, we're thinking about the lyrical content, the imagery that is conjured, how meaningful the artist is for the individual, how relevant the rhythmical contents are. So if you're engaged in an activity such as station recycling or uh, working on a ski machine running, you need a very constant rhythm without accelerandos and ralentandos. The tempo and how that relates to your desired physiological state. And the overarching point that I tried to get across was this notion of the music program contouring the physiological state and being embedded in a functional way with each element of the workout. Thank you so much, Dr. Kara Georges. That was excellent. I have final qu three questions that I ask everybody. And before I get to that, there was something that was highlighted in a recent book I read, uh, Stealing Fire by Stephen Kotler and Jamie Wheel. And they mentioned uh, electronic dance music and its ability to enhance flow. And sort of that is the reason why it's gaining popularity. Do you have any opinion on that? Or is this just more a matter of going back to what appeals to people and sort of that appeals to the Silicon Valley tech crowd that is looking for flow and therefore they're getting it? Well, there are certain intrinsic qualities in that type of music in terms of how the beat is organized, its regularity, its repetitive structure, the kind of musical hooks that are used and we talked about the influence of music on brainwave activity earlier, and you do tend to get a very strong entrainment effect. Entrainment is where uh, bodily pulses, such as your breathing rate, your heart rate, and your brainwaves are synced in to the rhythmical qualities of the music. So it does have the propensity to create a sense of trance or flow. But that type of music does not have a monopoly on flow state. There are many people who profess to uh, enjoying flow state with classical music, for example, with the music of Beethoven or the music of Mozart. For me, it's Oscar Peterson. For others, it might be Motorhead. When we understand about the way that music influences the human psyche and, re and people's responses in psychological terms, there is a great deal of conditioning involved, i.e. you repeatedly expose yourself to a particular type of music over a prolonged period. You develop an expectation that you will feel and behave in a certain way. And when you're subsequently exposed to that music, you behave in a certain way. If you grow up in a subculture of thrash or heavy metal music, and when you're out with your mates, you feel very aggressive and aroused when you hear this music and you start banging your head. When you hear it again 20 years later, it's likely to have a comparable effect, mm -hmm. i.e. it's a conditioning effect. And we need to remember this, that sometimes the effect does not apply across all individuals. It's not what we call a, a pan-human effect, but it is dependent on how people have been conditioned in their everyday music listening experiences. Final three questions for you. These are a bit rapid fire, but or at least the first two are. So what is your top trick for enhancing your own cognition, meaning focus? One of the big challenges that I face in my life is that as head of uh, a division as well and line managing many academics is that I'm having to spin many, many plates at once. I'm firefighting every single day. So things go wrong unexpectedly and uh, I have to deal with them. But at the same time, there are critical things that pertain to my research and scholarship that I have to keep going. Otherwise, my, my research and the thing that I'm most here for would be swallowed up by all of this noise and all of these other things that go on every day. My top trick for enhancing cognition and enhancing productivity is that for certain parts of the day, I shut myself away from the outside world completely. There's no email, there's no phone, there's no disturbance. I focus purely on the here and now and what it is that I should be doing in terms of research. And that is how I've managed to remain productive through my life because as I've grown in seniority and had more and more responsibility, paradoxically, it takes you further and further away from the reason that you came into academia for. Mm -hmm. And so 
that's my tip to, to anybody who has uh, much responsibility and a panoply of activity. Shut yourself for a few hours every day and do the thing that is most important for you. And for me, it's writing and scholarship. It reminds me of a, a great book by Cal Newport, Deep Work, um, if people want to check it out. But a uh, second question is, favorite book on peak performance? When I was a young undergraduate, my mentor and my tutor at the time, uh, Peter Terry, who went on to become Professor Peter Terry, wrote a book titled The Winning Mind. I read this from cover to cover in the first couple of days after I bought it. And I read it again and again and again and again until all of its learnings were ingrained in my psyche. So that was a great book that was influential for me and a book that I have applied in many of the things that I've done subsequently. And Dr. Kara Georges, if people wanted to find out more about your work, where could they find you? Would, uh, would PubMed be the best place to go or where would you recommend people going? During my career, I've always striven to make my research available to the general public. And I think as academics, we owe it to the public and in particular to the taxpayers to make the fruits of our labor widely available. So I'm no exception in that regard. And if your readers want to find out about my research, it's in fact the case that all of my uh, published outputs are available as free downloads. They need to go to the Brunel University Research Archive if they enter my surname, Cara Georgis, that's K-A-R-A-G-E-O-R-G-H-I-S, they will from there be able to download any of the past research. Uh, I also have a web presence with a university. So again, using my surname, they can enter the Brunel University website and find me very easily with details of my teaching, the sort of consultancy work that I've done through the years, and of course, the research that I've done. In terms of social media, day-to-day -day interaction. My research group, the Brunel Sound and Visions Innovations Group, has a Twitter account that is at Savvy Brunel, at S-A-V-I Brunel. So on there, you can find the state of the art in terms of uh, music interventions, music and video, virtual reality, priming and all of these other things relating to audiovisual stimuli in exercise and sport that we work on. You can find that, you can find amusing tidbits, publications, um, interesting discussions from time to time, uh, and events such as seminars, public lectures, etc. They're the key places. Also, I have three books available. There's uh, Inside Sports Psychology, that I published with uh, Peter Terry, who I mentioned earlier, uh, published by Human Kinetics. In fact, all of my books are published by Human Kinetics. Uh, most recently, I uh, published Applying Music and Exercise and Sport, which has been the main theme of today's podcast. And associated with Applying Music and Exercise and Sport, there is a continuing education course and study guide in case that in any of your listeners work in the health or fitness industry, they can pick up uh, professional development credit for taking the course. And I'm sure many will be interested in the more targeted and scientific application of music in the exercise, health and physical activity domain. So that's where to find me in case anybody is interested. Dr. Kara Georges, I owe you a debt of gratitude. First on the book, uh, applying music and exercise and sport. I have it open right behind me. It's it's fantastic. Thank you for all the work you've done. All of your research has helped me as a person who enjoys the science understand a lot more about why it, music may influence me to push h further, harder, and do exercise better. So thank you for all of the work you do. Uh, and uh, thank you for coming on the podcast. It's been a great pleasure to share it with you today, and uh, I wish you continued success in your podcast endeavors. Thank you. And to all the superhumans listening out there, have an excellent day. Did you enjoy that episode? If you have any feedback or if you just enjoyed it, you can drop a note over at podcast at decodingsuperhuman.com. If you can also go over to iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, wherever you listen to this podcast and leave a five-star review, maybe a few comments so that people can hear what's going on at Decoding Superhuman with this podcast, it would be really, really appreciated. I look forward to hearing from you and have such an epic day. Take care.